Well, welcome everybody to the first session, you know, of uh, this new program that we're building. Uh, we have two incredible guests today with us, uh, Joe and Evgeny. Hello and welcome. Hello. Uh, please, Evgeny, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit who you are and what is the company that you're running. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Evgeny. Uh, I'm a CEO and founder of Intermute. Um, together with my co-founder, uh, Jan, that we commonly refer as Yo uh, for quite some time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's because, I mean, similar to Juan, who calls himself JMR, we, we have our names mispronounced for many, many years. Um, yeah, yeah, so we are uh, um, just pleasure to be here, and then we can, we can crack on. Very excited to, to share, to share, you know, the, the story the go through the the blood the blood the, you know sweat and tears of a uh, you know co building into you all right so i'm going to start the question because i want to contextualize for people to understand it how old are you guys i'm going to start directly with a personal question so should i, I start so I'm, I'm 40. you're 40. great and evgeny how old are you uh 39. 39 amazing i'm 38 uh, myself that was an easy one yeah <laughs> Yes, that was an issue I get. So the whole idea is like, now we're going to start talking about the, the birth of, of Wintermute and how Wintermute was created. So the first question that I have for you both were, Evgeny, what were you doing before you built Wintermute? Yeah, right. Um, basically, I was in what like we in crypto commonly refer as ThreadFi. Uh, basically, for 10 years before Wintermute, I was working at Optiver, which is one of the largest market makers in ThreadFi space. And what, what I was building there, what I was doing there is basically creating the ATF market making efforts uh, pretty much from the scratch. Uh, yeah, bro growing it from basically me to pretty much like 20 people team by the time I left. Okay, amazing. And what was the, the decision? How do you came up with the decision of just, you know, maybe leaving your, your job and just building a company or, or how did it came about? Yeah, it was kind of almost existential, I don't know, scare for me because basically I was looking at all the traders at Optiver. I was looking like where would they go? Um, and they would either retire and do nothing or they would retire and they would retire and do something like a mini Optiver, basically like a small version of it. But like I haven't seen any anyone doing anything ambitious or anything like super cool or something that I was would be like excited about. And it, all, it was kind of crazy because, well, and scary because you, like, I was kind of worried that I, my experience is becoming more and more narrow. Um, and if I would leave Optiver, like, I, would, I wouldn't I would really know what to do. And I kind of felt that I needed to escape this, needed, I needed to go out as soon as possible and try something, like, if I really want to try. And parallel to that, Optiver grew from this relatively small and nimble company to, into a proper corporate. And it was really interesting to witness the journey and to learn basically from it how it basically grew into grew into having all this interesting and like not so interesting and kind of boring corporate functions like control and everything. Um, and also realizing what drives me as well uh, alongside. So that it wasn't just the money, which is well, typically why people go into trading, but also, but for me, it was much more, much less about the money at a certain point, but much more about well, basically building stuff, like running my own team, yeah. hiring people, and yeah, doing all that. And were you like unhappy or on the trade or the job? Or it was more like you really wanted to build something new from the scratch? Or what is the the, the spirit, you know, of the, of the founder that you had, that you had to do it? Yeah, it wasn't like unhappy. It was more like I didn't feel I was growing, basically, I guess. I guess that that was the main feel. I didn't feel I was growing. I didn't feel that it would take me anywhere professionally or personally anymore. Like I would just do same old, same old thing. I could stay for another five years and do the same stuff, but I would just be stuck in time forever. Okay, amazing. And then you decided to, you had in mind already like Wintermute, a, a trading company, or what was the thesis that you started with? Oh, right. I'm not, not at all. Like I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about crypto. Like I was... Primarily thinking, okay, I just want I need to do something else. And I actually went through multiple things. Like I moved cities, I moved from Amsterdam to London, and I was exploring a lot of different things. 
I was looking at the startup scene. I was, I even applied for uh, like uh, top consultant for consultancy firms and uh, luckily didn't make it <laughs> past the final rounds of McKinsey. Um, so like I, I actually explored quite a bit before I went back to the drawing board and uh, followed up and basically started looking at crypto. Okay, amazing. And then you were not working with Joe yet, but you guys kind of knew each other already, right? You guys were in each other radar. I think Johan knew me better than I knew him, probably, because like I'm I'm generally not very good at remembering people. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what that's why we end up in the roles we are today. That's okay. Um happy to happy to do to, to give a bit more background uh Gemma. Yeah, of course. You... Yeah, tell so, me, tell me your story. Um, <laughs> sadly, my first venture was in success like like Yevgeny. Sadly, I had to go through basically three three others. I, the first one was was moderately a success. So uh, I also worked for Optiva between the 3rd of April 2006 and basically the 31st of March 2010. And as soon as I left, I I was, to, to answer your question as well, as I, I was a bit frustrated I was, um, as Optiva had grown from this very entrepreneurial firm to a more, more of a corporate. And I was more part of this generation that had been hired to, to be more builders. Um, so... I was 28 at the time, and I had two of, two of my juniors from Ottawa who, who, who followed me, who were 26, uh, and then I had a moderate success, but a ton of learnings, so not not the best alignments with um, with investors, and and uh, similar to Yevgeny, I I thought I could do better. So basically, I wasn't I was the one senior guy there, and I just wasn't I wasn't learning. So I spent three three four years making some money, but uh, there to build a company, but but not you know not 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 having not having the full alignment of planets. Then I spent time. 2014, 17, especially more as a building two other firms, one on the venture studio side, uh, made a bit of money so between India and and, uh, and uh, the UK. Um, and another one that was cross-border consulting essentially between more China and Europe. And um, all this came to essentially what most people would call a portfolio career as a you know investor advisor kind of career. And when I reconnected with Yevgeny first, it was through an Oxotiva called Nikolai, in, in, uh, who maybe still lives in uh, Boston. But essentially, he suggested that as Yevgeny had moved to London, that I should connect with him and potentially co-invest. So as, as Yevgeny was saying, he was iterating on what he would do next. And I, th I thought it was more, actually, it would be more uh, us co-investing as uh, angel, uh, business angels. Um, and for me, the road to interview has been more about, um, I had been building more of a, I was spending, uh, I was, managing some of my money with a family office in London. And I was sitting next to a, um, a former Marshall Waste. So, so, so for Marshall Waste is known as being uh, one of the largest long short hedge funds in London. And essentially he, he gave more validation of the crypto space to me. So we reviewed about 56 ICOs together and um, he was allocated. He, he suggested to me, if I have a, a crypto sleeve in the, in the macro hedge fund, you know, would you manage it? And I said, yes, but, I'll only know how to do it market, with market neutral. Essentially, I need another trader. I need a security, someone who's much better than me. I'm not the best coder, so much better than me at, at coding. And then, and then uh, we connected, you know, talked to Yevgeny about this. And, uh, you know, he was already, um, he was, he was already the other, uh, the other trader and he had, he had, uh, he had Harold on the team already. So, um, so essentially, yeah, we, we, we got to, uh, a very good, uh, a very good fit there. Um, yeah. And okay, so now you guys started to, well, at this point, Evgeny built uh, the first version of this by himself, and you were not part of the project, Joe. You joined, I think it's one year later, Evgeny, something like that, the timeline? Yep, like maybe half a year later, yeah. Because we, we started year. working in July 17, and you joined around January 18, I think. Okay, and how were yeah, the first so we... few months? Sorry, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I think technically we... We, the, the cap table was essentially not formed and then we, we signed all the, we agreed on shares and stuff maybe around December and then it was papered in January 2018. Um, so I think, yeah, the end of, the end, end of January 2018. But go ahead, yeah. Okay. And tried, I tried to understand a little bit more how the, the heart of the, of the founder again. At this point, is this exciting? Is this scary? I mean, you guys just left the job that was profitable and secure and safe and now you're coming to a, a new startup, you know, where money, uh, salaries are not really a thing, you know, at the beginning. Because 
how long it took you guys to start making a living out of out of this company and started making money and all that, you know? Yeah, I think like it's important. I mean, to a degree, both of us started it kind of easy. Like unlike a lot of founders who start like, I don't know, who in Hungary, like we just left October, both of us. So we did have a bit of safety execution. We had like one or two years basically to experiment uh, more or less. Um, so like from that perspective, it was easier, I guess, and for, for the rest of us, for the rest of like normal builders. But at the same time, it was very much uncharted territory for me, uh, for our first CTO, Haro, who I started with. And so, yeah, back, back to your question, like the first three months, we basically, I kind of like learned to do this trading thing back from scratch because back at October, it was, I don't know, as a trader, I would go to developers and tell them code this. And like one month later or a few weeks later, they would come back with some new trading algo and I would implement it, make money or not make money. And it would be just like me waiting on developers. So I started like doing work and initially in the same kind of way with Haro. And very, very quickly, I realized, okay, I can sit and wait like for him to do stuff, but I am not really contributing much because like we started our first algos uh, on Kraken. Um, so I was waiting for Haro to deliver stuff. I would I know, download CSV, uh, CSV files with our, with our trades, uh, put them in Excel, see how it's going. And very quickly I realized, okay, if I really want to move it faster, I actually need to learn how to code. And so I basically set up for myself to learn how to code in Python, which was very, like, on one hand, difficult because it wasn't tennis and I was ever doing it October, but at the same time it was pretty exciting because it was suddenly like suddenly you not only learn a new skill but you also real understand much better the other side of it and i think it was kind of like a common theme for me growing with intermute because okay first I understood coding and architecture and like how it all actually really really is important to understand as a trader then you understand i don't know all kinds of things hr accounting fundraising like you need to accustom yourself with pretty much every part of the business and i don't think you can be a truly successful founder if you don't dig into at least a bit into every one of those aspects okay so now we're gonna go forward with the story of of the beginning so now you guys are finally together one and i want to ask one more question about this because it's obviously something that we covered many of many panels is when you're choosing a, a co-founder or a partner to build a company with your this is a very very important decision that you're making what made you want to work with each other yeah i can start like to me the number one thing i was using was trust and basically like i knew haro because we worked together at october i didn't know yon that well but still i knew that he was at october for enough years to basically consider him trustworthy in a way so that that was kind of like the most important thing for me, trust, because like hearing all kind of horror stories about like founders, like kind of betraying each other and stuff like that. I would just, I just wanted to make sure that, I don't know, like I can work with those people, like Optiva has a certain, Optiva has a certain like uh, understanding that if you work there for enough years, it basically means that you're smart. So it's like, very was very easy for me to choose founders like this. And I think the second thing was just complementarity. So with Harry, it was easy. It was just like he learned, he knew how to code. I didn't. And with Johan, it was much more on the fundraising side because I didn't have much clue about how to fundraise. I didn't know much about I don't know, fundraising scene in London, for example. I didn't know like the most basic concept even then. Back then, I, I don't think I was confident enough in myself to actually learn it all by myself. I think now I would potentially approach it differently, but like this com complementarity between the three of us, it was also, yeah, pretty, pretty important. And for you, Joe, what was it? Yeah, similar thing. So on the Optiva bit, for people who don't know Optiva, in the trading world, it's a bit of a PayPal mafia. Essentially, there's a lot of people who have built all the trading firms. You know, we have a lot of ex-colleagues who've been quite successful at, at building trading firms in, in the chart fire space. Um, in crypto, a bit as well. So uh, I agree. I think it's a it's an alignment of culture. Uh, it's it's very much, um, very much completely 
uh, swimming in a, in a Dutch culture where people are very, very frank. They tell you very, very straight to your face if you're doing something right or doing something wrong, which creates a culture where it may be a bit aggressive, but it actually creates a culture where, it's, um, where you learn very fast. And if you don't, if you can't learn fast enough, you just get fired after six months. So I think this is what, what Yevgeny is, uh, is leading to when he's saying that you, when you spend a few years there, you must be good. You have to be good. Uh, that's one thing. I think there's also a, a good part of that culture that's more about uh, sharing. It's much more entrepreneurial than many trading firms where there's all these, you know, uh, company wide bonus balls and stuff. So people are much more incentivized in sharing information. And there's a big, there's a big aspect of uh, growth there. I agree with the aspect of trust. I think for me, um, with the benefit of having had, you know, three other ventures before, um, where I didn't find sometimes, so my first one worked quite well, but it wasn't the perfect alignment with, uh, with investors, but it was also with two So There's also a bit of this revalidation about, you know, who, who to work with. I think what's really important is, um, is essentially very much about, um, uh, finding the best in terms of co-founder, co-founder association is like where your spikes are. Um, and, um, and it was very much, even though my first title was head of trading, it was much more head of ecosystem as such, because we had to do a bit of a, a piping and a lot of a capital aggregation. So fundraising was very general fundraising. It was basically getting equity shareholders on board, but essentially, uh, also getting debt. And it turned out into much more of a BD role later, but it's essentially just getting, getting all the, anything that touches about financing and building the, the balance sheet to be able to trade from. Um, and for Yevgeny, is just trusting him as a, as a product builder. Uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a CEO, he was more, more of a CPO first. Um, and yeah, and, 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 and uh, having Caro involved at the time was really, really useful to get the skeleton, the skeleton. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think you want to, want to touch on market conditions later. So I'm not going to be able to segue into that or you can do that. So. You can segue right now. So, okay. Now, can... obviously, it's a, a very key, important part. You know, you guys decided to build a company. You guys are going to be fundraising. So what were the market conditions that you guys either read or anticipated that when you started, you know? So, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, can, I, can, I can start on this on the, because it's very, very in line with the, the fundraising question is that it was early. So we started early 2018 to raise. We had about half the round committed in March 2018. But I was seen an investor who was lead essentially wanted us to cover another, you know, the, another half a million, essentially. We, we ended up closing, a, closing the round at $925,000 in, in October of 2018, but it was, it was difficult in terms of um, all of my crown, as, as Evgeny was saying, I knew a lot of people who could, who could invest. True, but a lot of them were from the family, of, family office of the hedge fund space, people who understood trading, were essentially people who hated crypto at the time. Um, and uh, and that that proved to be to be a bit a bit challenging, but uh, but we got we got through that. And if it's difficult for us, my perspective is just if it's difficult for us, it's just difficult for everyone else to raise anyway. So uh, I think I think it's in general it's just a brilliant opportunity to to actually build in in um, in you know winters and in, in, in tough cycles. And a lot of really good companies, whatever. There's plenty of examples. Microsoft, Uber was funded in 2008. There's plenty of good exam examples of uh, people who build great companies in uh, in uh, low, the low the low uh, low side of the cycle. But yeah, we did, we didn't really expect that <laughs> as well. Like that, that's important to notice because yeah, when we mm -hmm. launched, it was July 17. That was like if any of you guys were around, it was it was a bit like 2021. Uh, just like it was really crazy, a lot of it, a lot of fun things going on. All the prices were going up, so it felt like yeah, it felt like very exciting, especially from trading side. It was like it felt just uh, yeah, very different to the strat fine markets that move like I don't know if they move like one percent a day, you're like oh that's a super busy day. Here you can have things like move 10, 20 percent either way, and yeah, that's like a normal day in crypto. Um, but yeah, like by the time we go we got together with Johan, and by the time we started fundraising, it suddenly switched from yeah, you know, crazy bull market to like not so crazy bear market. And it went from like very exciting to kind of like sad <laughs> and very challenging because yeah, it's it's uh it would have been pretty easy, I think, to raise in 2017. 2018 was a very different uh, picture. And from the beginning, you guys felt 
product market fit, what you guys were doing, or how was the first, let's say, a few months or a few years of what you guys were doing? Yeah, like our first ideas that we pitched to investors back then was we would be a market maker for ICOs, which was a really funny, like really fun thing because yeah, by the time we pitched it, it was already 2018. And by the time we pitched it, like those ICOs that would pay us back in 2017, like a lot of money, like by the time we went in with this idea and uh, product, uh, it basically was kind of too late, like less and less car ICOs were popping up and less and less of them were actually willing to pay for for any kind of for any kind of like services or any kind of like like training related stuff. So yeah, our initial idea was okay, we want we would be market maker for ICOs, but we will do it in a like compliance uh, like non-dodgy way because we've seen a lot of like market makers. Uh, who were basically just like pump and dumping, wash trading, those kind of things. And we wanted to position ourselves as a, somebody who is not that. Um, but we had to pivot. Like we had to pivot into more traditional prop trading uh, as we realized, yes, there is just not enough market. We had like a few, we managed to get like, I think one contract pretty much, uh, which didn't really go well. I'm not going to name the company. Um, but it was just like a typical scammy ICO kind of thing that, we tried and we understood, okay, we probably don't want to do this kind of stuff anymore. Okay. One thing I want to remind everybody that is here attending that we, or I can see the questions that you guys are asking if you want to ask, you know, so please engage if you want me to ask any of these things. Okay. So now you have to, you started a company, you fundraise in a time where it was not easy to fundraise. Then there was no part of market fit and you guys have to pivot. How do you sell these people to your board, to your investors, to the world? It was even more a scary situation or you guys felt confident and hopeful that you could just turn the ship around and you will find this product market fit? Well, basically, yeah, I guess it brings us like the, the first round was like it was difficult, but it was basically angel round. And I think yeah. Bjorn can talk about it a bit, bit about more, but we got quite lucky with our angels in general. Like they were very hands off and but also quite helpful advice wise but like very much like non-involved from perspective like they didn't really push us to pivot or not pivot like they were okay we gave you guys money like yeah go execute uh, the way you want so from that perspective we were quite lucky like hearing other like horror stories uh, out there I know you are, if you want to. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, the, the nuggets or the little wisdom I can share with other people is Choose your investors wisely. Um, that was the main mistake uh, for my first venture, where basically I had more allocators slash funds allocating money to me when I was there to build a firm. That. So that was in 2010. And, uh, and if you have too much of a mismatch between people who invest in you and what you want to build, especially the timeline that you need to build it. So we, we essentially spent the first two years building tech. Uh, so you can mention, you know, first first few algos and I think September 2017, I think, uh, for the first crack in algos. And essentially, until mid 2019, we were essentially still building tech. So we only really got the first 500k of loan to trade, and um, on the 6th of August uh, 2019. So that says that means you know there were essentially two years of building tech, and it, there were all the things that we've been building in terms of building networks, giving building good relationships with exchanges. Um, but essentially, uh, on, the, on the angel question, we found a very interesting fit where I was being told no by everyone I, uh, I knew on the sort of the hedge fund in the trading space. But I was actually getting some yeses from angels or co-investors of mine in more Web2 sort of B2B SaaS for, for more of you know, the co-investments I had made on, on the fintech, the fintech scene in London. And people were more long-term capital and people especially people who had um, uh, a spread betting background. People with spread betting backgrounds essentially understand market making. They understand emerging economies. And actually some of them, third, third point overlap, they understood cryptos. So some of them had been, you know, uh, sort of day one, especially one of them as a, a day one investor in Ethereum. So we, we used them a bit as a bit of as, as an advisor to better at the start as well, a bit to know who to speak to and who not to speak to in the crypto space. So choosing your advice is like, especially first, first, like two seed rounds as such 
um, is quite quite key to find good alignment with investors. Uh, but I think we've been quite quite lucky overall to be in a even Series A, Series B. We've been got quite a good quite a good cap table there. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll stick to that. Joe, what is a lot of appetite for to invest in you guys, or was it a hard one? You know, to fundraise. Um, there's always a lot of appetite. I like to fundraise as a formal. My best way to fundraise is just the train is leaving. Do you, do you want to jump on it? You know. So I like to do a revenue, more revenue led. So it was easier to do from CB when we had a bit more, a bit more traction. Um, we could show we were not really making money because 80% of the money was essentially going into fees, especially Binance already. Um, but we had more of a proof of concept. Uh, I think another element is it, it was easy enough for us to pitch ourselves as a, as the best, best team to do to execute on it um but even with them uh, even with that it was i think it was pretty um we had to make a choice early on to basically not trying to convert anyone to the crypto space it's only people who were in favor enough of the crypto space and then you know to talk to them and then just not not waste time with people who are just religiously against the cryptos especially 2018-19 Okay. Um, and, yeah. and and it was a it was also like double hard because not only we had to explain crypto we also needed to explain explain market making, um, okay. and it's a pretty tough combination to explain. Yeah, okay. yeah. You came up with that. We had this slide that we used to run all the time with the big formula trying to explain so really really synthesize how we made money because people were always asking. We 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 lost a lot of VCs in conversation about. What, what, what the product we were building because the problem of a, a trading firm is essentially you build your own product that you're the own user and uh that was that was a bit of a that, that was a bit of a dead end uh, often but uh but yeah i think it's just uh it, it turned out to be more about us uh, getting enough trust uh from you know the, the group of angels essentially in a uh, so C D A C B and then just being 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 at a level where you could show traction through just trading and how reliable things were. Um and yeah, it's just, just building 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 traction uh, across uh, uh okay. there's a few questions as well. But yeah. So I have a question for you that somebody yeah. asked. Uh if you know there is not a lot of appetite for these have you considered, or at a, I'm sure at one point you consider, hey, is it worth taking someone's money when we might not be a good fit for them, you know, or vice versa? We kind of have to get someone's money even though we don't have any fit, you know? So I guess I, it's, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can start your own, then I'll chip in. I can answer that diplomatically. We kind of have through, through more convertible and debt products. And we bought these people out. So essentially, okay. we we found that, like new geographies, we found people were like more. It's not that they were bad people, but some people, I think, uh, to to <coughs> sorry to Evgeny's point, we had to explain market making to a lot of people, and some people understood we were building tech and we were more of a tech fund, which we are. But some people thought that we were more of a fund, and people who thought we were more of a fund were not really persons we really wanted long-term on the cap table. So basically we, we, we took people, some people who were considered more of the fund and then we, we brought them out of our time to, to make sure we had that, that cultural alignment. Okay. So now let's put it in perspective. We've got macro again. We have level zero is the beginning of, of winter mute. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the brand before we move on for that, because I, I think that's an important part. Why winter mute? What does the brand mean to you as a founder? You know, what does it mean being associated with the brand that you created that is so close to you? Yeah, I guess like I, I can repeat because like may, may, maybe some people <laughs> some people already know the story. But yeah, like when, when I started, I wasn't that much into crypto. It was just uh, something that traded a lot. Um, and I thought, okay, like if we want to appeal to this crypto culture, which is most likely like very geeky, I just wanted to pick something that would appeal to this audience and like appeal to everyone from that perspective. So what I did, I basically, I needed a name and I really like coming up with names in general. I guess it comes from, I don't know, like playing a lot of uh, role-playing games in general, like where character creation just takes like hours usually for me. Um, but basically I Googled top 10 science fiction novels of all time, 
wrote down all the main characters from that list and the intermute <laughs> caught my uh, caught my attention because it is just like very unusual and I haven't read the I haven't tried Neuromancer back then, but I said, okay, that sounds that sounds like geeky enough and fun name, and it's like one of the main science fiction books. It will definitely like appeal to some people at least. Um, and as for logo, I basically did it also very like cheap, I guess. I basically like there is a website called Ninety Nine Designs, so I went there and basically I did a I did a contest for I think like something like one hundred ninety nine pounds, um, and I got I don't know. 20 subscriptions or something and uh, I shared them with friends and family and ultimately chose the ones that you guys see in front of you now um, and I've been quite happy with it uh, <laughs> so far I don't think we're changing it anytime soon you, got, you do have a good eye for branding so I give you that and obviously another thing that I want to talk about regarding the brand is at the end of the day the company becomes you and you become the company there is obviously so much of you guys in your own brand so I want to talk about the culture, you know, at this point, you are already finding product market feed, you're already fundraising, you're already bringing the employees. So you now have to set up the culture for the company. How was that for you guys? I think like initially, what I copied, like I copy pasted a lot from Optiver, simply because, yeah, like what you already mentioned, it was like a very, it's a very flat structure. Like it's not really about hierarchy. It's about like, well, who you are and the, uh, like you can go and talk to CEO, CEO at any given time. Like it's it's like very flat. It's very direct. So like people express their opinions like very freely, which I also thought would be nice to copy. And uh, also I wanted to copy this. Like a lot of trading trading firms operate in a silent way. Like you have different teams pretty much competing with each other under the same roof. And Optiver is kind of opposite of that, where like because of the shared bonus pool, people are like kind of like were very much incentivized to cooperate. So that was another aspect that I really wanted to copy paste at the, the internet as well. Um, but then it came to, yeah, like, what do I not copy effectively? And I think what I did not copy, and that's kind of like what was one of the main learnings in general for me is just like, you start by doing a lot of things by yourself. Like you are, as a founder, you just have to be very hands-on. You need to learn a lot of things which are completely new to you, whether it's coding or accounting, like doesn't really matter. Like you just need to learn everything. And at the end of the day, like all the team leads that we currently have, have like none of them are just like hands-off managers. Like they're all very hands-on people. They either code themselves, they trade themselves, they work on weekends, even now, like it's all it's all like like this. And that's that's one thing that I did not necessarily copy because managers at Optiver, like they tend to sometimes uh, move away from trading and be like less, uh, less, less hands-on. But for us, it's pretty much a requirement. And it's, it's basically, yeah, that that's up. Like now it's like one of the essential like culture values that we have that, yeah, we don't have, I don't know, people who are just, okay, I'm going to focus on my narrow thing and do it. Like we do want people to go outside of the comfort zone. I don't know, like if you're a business development person and you get a, like a simple contract, you go and read it and try to understand like what it is before you forward it to legal, for example, which, yeah, person might hate initially, but ultimately it just brings so much more, like it just brings so much more understanding to every single role of how business works. And that's like this kind of like ownership that, broad understanding of things is, uh, yeah, that, that's quite important for us culture-wise. Joe, do you want to add something to the culture part? Yeah, I think I think uh, it's actually kind of uh, echoes from from choosing choosing good co-founders as such. It's just in terms of work ethics. Uh, I mean, for us, it's just let's let's it's a fully certified workaholism. That's just you know, let's just put it that way. Uh, so there's, there's, <laughs> we 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 uh, you know we we crystallize this around sort of, you know, meaning and so on. It's true. We don't do that for money and so on, but it, essentially we, we all want to grow and be quite active. And then we, we, I think there's, there's a general um, focus on doing things well. And then to do things well, you just have to spend the time uh, on it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, to, to Yevgeny's point, I'm more, um, you want to be in a position like we are, 
where I use the it doesn't happen too much because I'm on like on this time zone, but I would just ask our head of trading who happens to be also French, but we you know work quite long hours at 3 a.m. to kind of switch off and uh, you know take a bit of rest or so. So if you're in a position where you where you hire people, uh, you're lucky enough that you can hire people, um, you know smarter than you and and very hardworking and so on. You got the right amount of stamina and uh, and very honest. And you have the perfect, you know, combination, perfect alignment of planets to to really scale from from there. So uh, um, it's funny how we had at the first, I would, I would say, first five to ten employees were a lot more eclectic. So some of them have gone their separate separate ways, but I think in terms of culture, it's, it's a a very transparent, honest, hardworking, uh, you know, smart uh, culture that we've 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 got now. So I'm pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty proud of this as such. So, um, hence why you know six and a half years in, we uh, we 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 are on the deck every day. Okay, okay. So we're gonna go again. Like Micro, as I said, we have the beginning of winter mute. Now you have level two. We start bringing Joe. There is level three. We bring financing. You guys set the culture, and then at one point, did you felt the uptake? Okay, this actually works. What we have is working. We have a model that is working. We're now profitable. We're making money. And now, if we feel that way, what do we do now? Do we double down? Do we triple down? And yeah, I would love to hear from you guys how did that felt. Yeah, like this whole theme of finding the product market fit, I feel like, like most people think, okay, like you have an idea, you execute and then you get there. But like, I think... Like from my experience uh, with Wintermute, it took us some time. And when it happened, it was almost unexpected. So like throughout 2019, for example, we worked hard, like we built those algos, we improved those algos, and it was just not working good enough. Like it was covering the fees. We're making a bit of money every month, but it was just like not enough. And then January 2020, everything suddenly clicks. And it was like three or four things that combined made it so but we've tried like different combination of three or four things like previous months which didn't work and then suddenly like it clicks and suddenly like we're starting well not necessarily like printing money but like suddenly okay january the first month when they are beyond break even and february like we have three acts of that and march like there is a crash in uh, crypto and we made the uh, like more in one day than we made in January, February combined. Like, and then then kind of like starts, uh, yeah, just starts rolling. And that's when I guess you realize, okay, you can like, you can go with it like it is now, or you can actually, like you can actually work hard to scale it and bring it to the next level. And that was kind of back in February and March. That's when it really clicked. And it was a really interesting, like, part of, uh, yeah, it was really interesting thing where at, on one hand, we were making money, finally. On the other hand, if you guys remember, that's when the COVID started. Um, and one main worry on my side was, and that's back then, was like a pretty big worry for a lot of people is that what if all venture funding just completely dries up? What if like nobody's going to invest anything until COVID finishes? So I basically started like me and Jon, we basically started uh, scrambling to see, okay, like we have a better story now. We have like this uh, hockey stick graph, like it looks nice. Um, let's raise on the back of that to basically scale our trading capital, but also just in case, if in case basically all funding will dry up completely because of COVID for the next, I don't know, one or two years because nobody really knew where it was going. Like in the, visit, in the hindsight, yeah, like everyone knows that that's where crypto really picked up that year. And uh, yeah, venture investment was not really an issue. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of like what drove us uh, back then in like February and March. Okay. Yeah, to, to, to add more color to that, I think there's too many inflection points in the business. The the one Yevgeny mentions is the, the trading, kind of trading on screen, the technological the, the tech inflection point where we, we, we got models right and we started to, 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 to do two things to show that we could make money and then to show that it was reliable and actually three things that to show that it was scaling and especially the, the movement. So the, I think it was 13, sorry, 12th, 13th of March, 2020, where essentially Bitcoin sold 3,800 
printed printed sub four thousand at that time uh, during during the the the, the, the crash and um, and and we had we we actually the infrastructure showed to be quite resilient, which is great for venture investors and so on. So especially when people don't fully understand what you're building, they just see revenues. They just they you know it's just proof proof is in the pudding. So it's really 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 useful. I think there's another inflection point on the on the commercial side that was more about us covering uh, you know from a market making point of view, basically the first few big foundations towards. Uh, the summer and essentially mid October, especially 2020, uh, when we when we started to get a lot more traction commercially. Um, okay. And that's sort of no, sorry, that's uh, you want to finish that thought? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and then yeah, that's 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 about it. Um, so now to again play in macro picture. Now things are working. Now there is an up stick. Now you have to figure out. Okay, now. We need to fundraise again, or we need to figure out what to do because COVID might just hurt everybody, and everybody stops. So you fundraise again? Yeah, pretty much. And okay, that one was a bit different. Uh, like the previous two rounds, like were painful. Like it was crypto winter still. Like it was really hard. That one, we actually got to a point where we had like venture funds competing for us, which was like quite nice for a change. <laughs> um, and I mean, that that's kind of like, that, that tells you all about it, about, yeah, like once you once you achieve this product market fit, once you can demonstrate this hockey stick graph, like that's when the yeah, magic can happen and you don't need to rely on like luck or connections or anything else. Like it's, it becomes much, much easier. And it, it obviously like, it plays a big, like the part of the market, market cycle you're in plays a massive role in it as well because like not known to us, that was like pretty much the beginning of market cycle and a lot of venture funds already kind of like knew that. Okay. So now a lot of people always think like, oh, fundraising is the objective, but no, fundraising is the beginning. Now you fundraise. So now what? You're trying to go to another level, you know? You're trying to scale your company to somewhere else. So what was the, let's say the hypothesis or the thesis for that fundraise and where do you guys want it to go? Basically the main thesis was like, we had a pretty small balance sheet. As a trading firm, you need, you know, like you need as much capital as possible. Um, so the main purpose for fundraise was to to scale our balance sheet to basically like double or triple it, so we can deploy more capital and make more money. Because we we knew that we like our strategies were profitable. We knew that we can scale them way beyond two x. Uh, like if you two x our capital, we still make pretty much the same. Like well, we'll like double what what we can make effectively. Um, so it was a very easy, well, not, not necessarily like easy, like, right. It's the, the dilemma you're facing. Okay. Do I dilute myself to go faster or do I just grow organically and normally? And basically the decision we made back then was, yeah, we just want to accelerate because, okay, we see things happening. We see that stuff is working. I'd rather dilute myself by another, whatever, 10%, um, then like slow things down because, Another thing that was on my on my mind back then is like we were doing fine, but we already saw like okay, there was already jump, there was already Alameda somewhere earlier, okay, like there was GSR, like there were a lot of our competitors who were bigger than us. And we just had to catch up. And the only way to catch up for us was to keep diluting ourselves, keep like doubling up and keep keep really aggressively growing and growing, because otherwise I felt like yeah, we we're just still like they would grow, but like even though they would grow at a slower pace percentage wise, they would still like well, the distance would keep increasing if it makes sense. Absolutely. And then I wanted to actually we get to the stage now to the point where the the, the title of the of the season one is how do you become a market leader? At these points now you are like you said you are growing, you are diluting yourself to get more capital to continue growing to all that, but then by the time you are in the front all the wind is in your face. How do you now become the market leader? And how do you have to change from the way that you operate to the way that you hire to the way that you do things when you're in the front? Good question. I think it's it's not necessarily about changing, but like you need to scale, but it's very like, I would be very cautious about like, okay, it's, it's easy like to go from, 10 people to 20 people like going from 20 people to 50 that's a different thing and going from like 50 to 100 that's another thing 
And like, if you would ask me into back in like 2020, okay, I would say, okay, I would, I want to grow to the size of Optiver, maybe like a few thousand people and like be really big. Um, but having grown from like five to 10 to 50 to almost 100 now, it's, I don't think I want to get, go there anymore because it's, it's a very, like, you have to compromise on a lot of things on the culture side. You have to compromise on almost pretty much the, like the way the business works as well. And so you need to ask yourself, okay, if I want to, like, can I grow into this position of market leader without compromising our, on our core values, without compromising on culture? Like, how do we keep hiring people? Do we compromise on quality of our hires, for example? And I think a lot of firms do choose to compromise. Um, and I think for us, the decision was, yeah, we just don't want to do it. Like we kept growing relatively like slow. Like we didn't grow into hundreds of people in 2020, 2020, 2021, because we kept the bar pretty high and we wanted to yeah, make sure that we do more with less people in a way that that was, that was pretty, pretty important. But we wanted to grow into like, we wanted to grow our balance sheet. We wanted to make money as well. So like, Back in 2020, we actually did two funds and rounds. One was like one was in uh, back in like June, where we raised uh, like almost three million from um, Lightspeed, and then we did another one in August. So like it was just like two three months. Well, I mean it was announced in December, but it was pretty much agreed in uh, August September. Where so it was like just three months in between, which tells you all about uh, how quick crypto is. Where we were, we raised twenty million, and that one, like in hindsight, was probably not necessarily like the best uh, way to dilute ourselves because, like, we like come twenty twenty one, we basically started making like this money, this amount of money in a month. So we didn't necessarily need that kind of money, but at the moment when we raised it in in August, again, it made sense to do it simply because we we, we wanted to accelerate and wanted to keep growing. And yeah, I saw it with the corner of my, somebody asked about the UM. Like we started 2020 with something like two, three million a UM. We started 2021 with hundreds of millions, basically. So it was like very, very different. Yeah. And yeah, and on uh, on, on color on, uh, on how many people we did, we spent most of 2021 with between 20 and 25 people. And mm -hmm. uh, it was good to iterate on this. But when you're in, like me and doing like 18, 19 calls a day, it works for a certain time, but it doesn't work at some point because <laughs> you're doing 15 minute calls and you can sign on enough customers, but but then you, there's, you, you, you need to build up, you know, a bit more of a aftercare and then, uh, uh, you know, make sure, make sure there's, there's a, there's, there's a bit more people to, to assure, you know, just more redundancy and so on. So actually uh, what we're doing, uh, what we were doing in 2021 with Jonathan and I essentially and Aurora a bit later, uh, eight people do this today and then there's, and it just allows to just to, to scale the company. So um, yeah, it's just it's just more redundancy, just just uh, um, it just just to, just to, and it just enables us to to do more things afterwards. So we we started investing as well uh, in the summer of 2020. And we started incubating. I don't know when did we start really incubating teams, Evgeny? Like a year ago or so? Yeah, yeah. Mm, I'd say 2021 technically, but like mm. real reality 2022. I would I would add one last thing about the scaling uh, side. Like a big factor was how the compensation is structured at Internet. Um, because we have this shared bonus pool, like there is a very important concept of like we don't have like what some other companies might easily call like right. useless people. Everyone we want to hire, one way or another, they tap into this bonus pool. Some more, some less, but like everyone has exposure to it. And that basically creates this other dimension to it that, okay, you, you hire this person, he will effectively take a slice of a pie of everyone else. So you want to make sure that he increases the pie enough so that everyone else like will be happy with them joining. And that's that's pretty interesting part of the like like implied part of the culture in a way that we like don't hire useless people in a, in a way. I'm very uh, curious that you chose to share this today because I obviously had conversations with you about this and it's a very unique way of thinking. 
Uh, we're going to go a little bit further uh, on the time that we wanted because I think that this conversation is very good and there's a few things that I really want to still go through. By the time that now you guys are talking about all this market share, all these things, there is more money, there is more things, there is more objectives. What keeps you going? I mean, at this point, you could just go and just drink pina coladas in an island, but you guys wake up and I see both of you, how passionate you are, are and how much you work and how much you travel and how much, why? What What is this this drive that you guys have? Either of you. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> I, can, no, I, can I, can yeah. <laughs> I can start and you can pay it back. It's okay. Um, I think there's there's always a search of meaning as such. I think personal growth is really, really important. I think, um, you know, so just for myself, I just, I don't exactly know what else I would do. If I, to be honest, if I was in building, I would probably just be investing and I would feel frustrated and investing. I'd probably just do uh, sort of side building as such. So I think, I think for me, it just makes sense in terms of who I like to work with, who I can learn from. Essentially, it's, it's very much the, I, I feel that I'm surrounded by people smarter than me, which I love, which is, which is exactly how we should hire people. So, I can go and piggyback on uh, whatever the DeFi team when I need to learn about a new protocol that we may want to invest in. There's there's a there's a ton of uh, interactions that are that are intellectually stimulating. Um, on the personal level, I've moved to to Asia a few months ago, and I, uh, you know I, I find refreshing to learn new languages and so on, and just to learn new, new cultures and so on. It's quite quite interesting to see how how things work here in Asia. Um, I I think the only thing is I would say just like I don't see what else I would do to be quite honest. One thing, and then two, I think we I appreciate my luck. So essentially, I think it, having had other ventures that didn't necessarily do as well for you know many reasons, and it's just uh, not going to expand on this. But I think I think it's just uh, good to to appreciate the uh, the opportunity and just to respect the opportunity. So um, so yeah, that's. That's the gist of it, really. I would say on my side, like to start with, I'm not like, I'm very low maintenance person. Like I don't find it fun to either buy an expensive car or expensive watch or like, I'm like, I don't need much to sustain myself. I don't need much to like, I don't know, many things to buy. I know like I can buy whatever. I have okay. I have three kids, so that that that's quite a bit to the burn, but it's still like manageable. Um, but yeah, like at some point, okay, I can buy like a whole Star Wars Lego lineup for that particular year. Like it doesn't take much money, or I can buy like all the new Warhammer sets, like that just came up. Like it's like I'm very like not needy, not uh, like I don't need like millions and millions and millions to enjoy life. I mean, travel travel takes a bit, but still, like it's like it's pretty small. So. Already back and back when I left October, like I could have settled down and could have like chilled for the rest of my life by just going and working, I don't know, in a bank or I don't know, some other like normal thread five corporate work where you can work nine to five. Like I think a lot of people do recognize that like a lot of those jobs you don't need to work super hard to just be there. Um, like it's pretty easy. To, for like ex trader with ten years experience to find the chill job and relax and uh, enjoy the enjoy the days. So already back then it was not an option for me because like there is no glory in that, there is no fun in that, and I just knew that it would be kind of like a slow death. Um, and yeah, building Vintermute has been like first few years were pretty brutal. Like it was pretty tough uh, from like. On one hand, you're building something, but on the other hand, you actually have no idea whether it will work out or not, and whether it will, I don't know, be like a massive blow up and just did not work. Uh, but once things start working, that's kind of like that's when I kind of rediscovered that part of myself that yes, on one hand, yeah, like I don't want to slow death. On the other hand, like there is this very clearly this element of uh, leaderboard in my head, like. I know there is like a leaderboard, I don't know, global leaderboard of, I don't know, people in crypto, market makers in crypto, or just like people on the planet. And what kind of drives me, uh, and that was kind of like what I learned about myself during this journey is like, I do care about this leaderboard. I do want to grow. Like, so it's not about whether I have like, I don't know, 1 million or 10 million or, or 1 billion. It's it's more about like where I am on this leaderboard, where Wintermute is on this leaderboard. 
and but also like what kind of brand we create behind it like that i'm growing and like i'm growing on this leaderboard playing by my own rules and doing it in a way that i enjoy basically and i find acceptable and I find like i don't know that we don't screw people around for example that we don't like scam people that we actually do it in a in a way that it's legit and that that i can be basically proud of i guess and i can basically give it back to i don't know that i basically can tell about it to my kids without them being thinking okay oh my dad is a scammer <laughs> which i think a lot of people crypto yeah might find challenging uh, those kind of conversations uh but i don't like i i can have those conversations. I can have those conversations like really nicely. And I guess it's like part of part of the part of this goal for me is yeah, to to be able to tell to my kids, okay guys, like yeah, I build this this is amazing. That's awesome. We have a few more minutes. Uh I want to have a few thoughts from you guys, you know, from learning from your biggest mistakes or biggest challenges or just let's say like the top three things, you know, that you if you could only tell this audience three things. What are the three advices that you have for them? Uh, Joe, do you want to start? Um, big learning, personal learning is, I'd like to think I can understand complex stuff, but I'm not the best explainer. So I think communication has been like a big thing to that I've worked on over the last the six, you know, five, six, seven years or such. It's internal communication. So it could be with you getting on like, getting the best alignment of what, what are we building here? What are we here for? And what, what are we working on? That's always, it became, as we grew, actually, it became more and more obvious. It was kind of easier in some ways. Um, but I think it's just, it's just, uh, it's something really, really key. Uh, key to know what problems you want to address, to filter through noise. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's big, a big, a big of a balancing act from entrepreneurship is just filter through noise and, um, know what questions you want to, you want to address. And then, uh, the ones you don't want to, you don't care about. And the ones you do care about. Make sure that, you know, essentially anyone and co-founders and management, everyone is aligned on, on how to answer them. Uh, one thing I learned really the hard way with, with fundraising is, uh, was essentially, uh, was essentially, uh, better storytelling or not explaining really what we were doing, but just, uh, something that uh, I mentioned it to you, JML, actually, I was, uh, I was on a, I was doing a fireside chat in Dubai, but I was also part of a panel. I was judging a panel of, uh, startups pitching 13 teams pitching. No one telling me they're the best team at solving the problem. So this is very good at identifying a problem and just saying, okay, we need this to, 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 to make it work. But then basically they just didn't know, um, they couldn't summarize that they were actually the best team at solving, solving this, this specific problem. And it's just, I think, I think a better storytelling just, uh, um, is, is really key. So better communication, you know, internal, externally. Um, on my personal side, resilience is good to a point. But, but, uh, you know, being, being resistant to pain and so on is not always good. So it's a bit like you need enough to filter through the noise, but you shouldn't really stay too resilient in the wrong direction for too long. Um, so, you know, it's, it's also a balancing act. Um, and also continuously just balancing exploration and, 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 and what to focus on is, is also a balancing act and not, not hesitate to crowdsource, uh, you know, crowdsource that, that decision and, uh, crowdsource a bit of thinking as well with uh, with people you can trust, but always with a bit of a you know a pinch of salt, a bit of a, um, yeah, just a bit of a bit of attention as such. But yeah, that's, okay. that's pretty key things on my side. Amazing, Evgeny, your turn. Um, so let's say yeah, I'm not sure I'll do three points, but like number one would be yeah, I'll do it a bit controversial, like be delusional. Um, as well, kind of like two aspects of it a bit to me. So like first aspect, like don't underestimate yourself because it's very easy. Like one thing I kind of very much changed in the way I operate is like, I'm that kind of, that kind of guy who plays those, I don't know, RPG games where I'll do every single side quest. I'll do like every single thing. I'll get like the, all the best legendary weapons. And then I'll go and like completely destroy the final boss with like no challenge whatsoever. And I'll take like my sweet time for that. Um, I had to change it like quite a bit for myself because like back when I did winter mute, I thought, okay, I'll, uh, there is so much competition. Like there is no way we can beat it. So we'll focus on like some niche things that nobody thinks about. So we focused on this like market making and five sales, which was like very unambitious. And it ultimately delayed us quite a bit because if we started with, if we started with 
prop trading, if you started with like going into the most competitive things, back then it wasn't that as competitive actually. Um, but like it was kind of like limiting belief on my side that yeah, I just wouldn't be able to compete. So you have to be delusional and think, okay, you better than you think you are. And the second delusional thing is, yeah, you, you should not overestimate competitors, com- competitors. Like you should not think that everyone is better than you or like you shouldn't think that like those legendary companies are as good as you think they are because companies are just companies made of people. They make like exactly the same mistakes and people are like far from perfect. And it's actually most of those companies look much better from outside than they're actually inside. And it's actually not that hard to compete if you uh, like if you just believe in yourself. So you have to be like ruthlessly delusional and just drive yourself, create this narrative, create this storytelling, like basically tell people and especially to people inside the company, you just like need to keep telling them, okay, guys, we can do it. And a lot of times you will fail and that's just how startups work, but you cannot be like modest and careful because then you will like, you just handicap yourself too much. That's kind of like one thing. And second is survival is everything, I guess. And we spent so much time in 2019 fundraising, like you all kind of touched on it, like all kinds of weird places, all kinds of weird structures. But if we didn't survive in 2019, like we wouldn't be where we are now. And that's, that's ultimately that's ultimately the ultimate test. And now we're in another bear market. Who knows? Like maybe next year it will pick up again, but maybe not. So you just need to survive. And that's that's super, super important. Amazing. That was very inspiring. We're gonna do a very fast QA. Uh we're gonna say questions and either of you guys can just pick it up, you know. First, how do you find good investors? You know, it's obviously one of the questions that you kind of touch upon, but if you want to talk about it. How do you find good investors? What are you looking at when you're trying to find a good investor? I think like, I, I'll, I'll quickly quickly do one and then uh, Jan can probably cover it much better. To me, it's all about people who understand, the, the, understand us, understand how it works and leave it pretty much to us to do the things the way we want them to do, to do things. And you can usually, like from my experience at least, you can filter out those people pretty much on the fundraising side. Like you can already see how involved they would be or how like, I don't know, too hands-on they would be. And I would I would generally like, unless you actually need certain amount, certain type of expertise from those people, from like those venture people, or angel people, I would advise against like two hands-on guys who would, I don't know, require invest updates every two weeks or like call every now and then when something happens. Like just don't go, I mean, unless you need to survive and you are not, you don't have opportunity to choose, like don't go with us kind of people. All right. That question was from Lin Nguyen. We have another question from Jin Hao that says, should first time founders look for advisors, mentors at the early stage? And is, is a speed execution the key to success? Or what other factors do you think that are important? Joe, sure. your turn this time. Yeah, on the advisory side, it just uh, depends how much it costs you. So I think we see, I get, I get annoyed with seeing advisors just taking too much of a, a share or so of first time founders. I've uh, got annoyed in, from early 2010, I had a lot of uh, Web2 investments that went through incubators and then they're just getting, um, getting a bit robbed through incubators for a small program. So I think it's about, it may be easier. To go to entrepreneurs, it may be easier to go to people who've built in your space and uh, ask them for advice. And there is usually the best advice you're going to get are from other entrepreneurs, really, but not really from investors per se. Or, or it's more, they may be investors now, but they, they often have been, you know, entrepreneurs themselves. So I think, I think it's just, you know, be a bit careful about, um, about the advice you take. I think the best advisors will be your future customers or future users. And not really the investors, so I think it's I think it's just you know just be careful about where the where the um the, the advice comes from, um, and um my perception has been especially with with my history with previous companies has been um if you're building long term if you have long term goals do do make sure you take long term capital you don't have people who just do you know just are there just there 
uh, to allocate capital short term. Just make sure that you have you have this is this is clear. Um, make sure uh, you touched on that, but essentially make sure that people trust you to do the job, and they're not the investors are not there to sort of take over and tell you what to do and how you should build your company and so on because it's a bit distracting. Uh, they should believe that you're the best person slash team to 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 solve that problem or to to go and build uh, what you're building. So I think I think it's just it's a yeah that's 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 the key pieces really. Um, okay. So we have another question from Jamie, but Jamie, I'm actually going to kick your question to the next session where we talk about if you obviously don't have funds to create this company at the beginning, you know, how can you access capital? We're going to have a whole session about this on session two. So I'm going to go to the next question is, Daniel said at the beginning when you were level one, level two, how many developers you had, you know, were you developing yourself? And then how do you expanded the team to get something specific that you didn't have or... I mean, in a way, how are you doubling down on your own strengths or finding was well, actually combined two questions, Daniela and a bit height. They're saying how many developers do you hire initially and then when do you expand? And then when you expand in, do you expand to double down on your strengths or to cover your weaknesses and acquire new skills? Okay, so first question, I think like yeah, that was definitely one thing that we did differently to October. Like remember when I said like okay, I had to start coding initially. So basically pretty much everyone we hired for a long long time and still like the way we hire like we never hire like pure traders and it's been like initially like the first hires that we did it was only like developers who would do trading or traders who would do a lot of development so like there was this a lot of those uh, hybrid roles and i think like 2019 we had like 10 people and like they all were like developers slash traders who were just doing both pretty much like some of them were doing less trading more development some of them were doing like as we around but it was it was pretty much um, yeah yeah pretty much combined roles um and second yeah it's, it's an interesting one like yeah how do you scale things like i don't know accounting or like so it's just auxiliary functions and i think at some point like for longest time we were doing it ourselves but like Especially if you look at Alameda, for example, Alameda, Alameda FTX stuff, like they didn't have CFO. Um, we kind of felt similarly to SBF, I guess, from that perspective that, okay, we understand accounting good enough ourselves, but ultimately to make yourself uh, like feel better and make your investors feel better, to make like outside people feel better. Um, and also to make sure that there is a second pair of eyes looking at things, you do need to duplicate those functions. And like I, like I'm still very much involved in a lot of those things, but you need to start outsourcing. Like you need to start delegating some of the like specialist tasks, like accounting or legal or com especially compliance. Like it has to be specialists looking at those. Um, and but again, like we like back to my previous point, like we again we don't see it as like something that we have to do then like we would never do it because I don't know if there would be no regulation we actually see those roles all those roles as very creative okay I have the last question for tonight and by the way a lot of the questions that you guys are asking we're going to be covering this in the other panels on the other sessions because we talk about product market feed we're talking about this but this specific question about product market feed I think will be very interesting here how did this question is from Shania how did you test your hypothesis of product market feed while you are building to understand that you are going in the right direction and not just into a blunt alley. I think for trading, it's yeah. I'll, I'll do. I'll do a quick one because then Johan can can finally finish. I guess like on my side, trading is one of those like very rare industries where you pretty much see right away whether you're going in the right direction or not. Like if you have a work in algo, you will see the same day whether that it works. Like okay, you need to scale it a bit, but it's like the cycle of like feed, feedback cycle is very quick. Like it works or it doesn't. So from that perspective, it was relatively straightforward. And like usually, like if it doesn't work, you also know which directions you want to go to, like kind of fix it. Yeah, and uh, to to complete on the, the question on the commercial aspect, as soon as people are happy to pay for it, um, essentially people happy to trust us with a borrow, for example, in the, in, the, in the case of providing liquidity. Then you you have product market fit because it means that they they trust that there's 
and as we said, there's continuity in terms of like seeing the quality of the quoting and so on, but essentially, um, yeah. Uh, and then I, I can I can pass whatever OTC the quality of the quotes you can give and so on, but uh, but essentially it's, it's it's how you you assess product market fit. We did have I mean on OTC it was the first OTC we did was a bit was was a bit you know a bit, a bit kind of random through a, a platform we traded on that that then you to do an OTC block. So there's a few things like this we we discovered as we as we went along. So um so yeah uh, and some of, some of the product market fit to be honest was guided by previous you know competitors who had. You know, gone and tried a few things and so on, and uh, and and actually sometimes had moved out of that activity. But um, but yeah, you, you can get a bit of guidance and competitors as well. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the long short of it. Awesome. Well, we are past our time. Uh, I really want to thank both of you for this amazing insight and just being candid and being open. I actually think that you guys share way more than I expected. So I hope that everybody appreciates it. And yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys want to say any final words from your side, Joe. Final yeah, thoughts? I would say uh, I would say just really uh, uh, just add on to to Yevgeny's. Maybe I don't know if you want to be delusional, but be very ambitious. Be more ambitious than you think you can do, just because it's um that there, there is a bit of a in a completely different space around language learning. I get frustrated a bit. The adults who say, "Oh, they can't, I can't learn a new language," is something that a kid should do. And it's the same thing in terms of entrepreneurship. Like there's a lot of people who should be entrepreneurs who should be trying things, who who basically thinks, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not the right time or so. So I think that the only right time is today, and then the better time was yesterday. So if you want to, you know, try something, just just go and try it, and and um, obviously just make sure that you can pay your bills and so on in between. But but uh, yeah, just don't don't hesitate to try stuff. Essentially, I think people people should try more. Yeah, like on you. my side, I, I I couldn't like I, it's pretty much what I would have said, I guess. Yeah, it's you just need to you just need to go and do it and see if you are built for this basically and set yourself a goal. Okay, I can I will I will sacrifice I don't know, two three years of my life for this and see if it works. And yeah, if it doesn't, it doesn't. But you just have to go all in. Like you have gonna kind of like do halfway. You just need to yeah, you need to be delusional and. Uh, Try it 